All right. Um, yeah, okay. So welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we're, I guess, we've been doing this series on great chess players of past and present. I know I did a lecture on Kramnik maybe a month or so ago, and today we're looking at none other than our current world champion and the greatest player who's ever lived, um, which would be Magnus. And um, I'm sure there's not even really a place to start with what he does well. I mean, I think you'd be very hard pressed to find any element of chess that anybody else has ever done better than him throughout the history of humanity. Uh, I genuinely believe that. I've, he's also one of the only, really the only like 2,800 plus guy I've had a real working relationship with in some capacity. And what I've learned from him is he has this phenomenally deep understanding of the game. Uh, and there's a lot of guys who have had that in the past. I still think not as deep as his, but intuitively, he just knows what's right. And part of that comes from brilliance. Part of it comes from study. But what he's combined that with is regardless of whatever persona he may portray, how much he sort of seems like he goofs around and posts silly pictures on Instagram or whatever, or, you know, seems like he's all having a party or having a good time. The guy works hard. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. He's put a huge amount of time and effort into chess over the course of his life. Uh, he organized a training session with Offerspiel, his new uh, chess club for all its top players, and hired me to train them for two days. And he showed up the second day and did all the same exercises as everybody else. This is a guy who has been very dedicated just to the study of chess. Uh, and I've chosen a couple of games here that I think showcase his incredible understanding of the game which again, partially comes from natural talent and partially comes from uh, this level of study, but also his ability to calculate and navigate complications in a way that you really can't just rely on intuition for and what he's been able to do in that regard. So the first game I wanna show is the game where he had been sort of been taking the chess world by storm. I think at this point he was already rated number one in the world, but he wasn't the world champion yet. And I was one of the last guys to get on the train like, oh yeah, Magnus is the best. This was the game that he played where I said, I believe he's going to be the next world champion. So this is a game with Luke McShane. Uh, I want to skip through the beginning because it's not the part that interests me. Um, opening didn't go great. Anyhow, uh, after some time, got a position like this one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's start here. I remembered taking one look at this position and saying, 2830 or not, there is no universe where you're going to save this game. You are busted, busted, busted. Like, it's just not even close. Come on. White has a clean extra pawn. You have no space, no nothing, like, no compensation whatsoever, endless weaknesses. How could you possibly save this game? It just struck me as completely foreign that this is even remotely feasible and this could possibly happen. So um, let's see how it went down. So McShane started with h4 and they ended up in, uh, let's say this position here. All right. The first step towards saving a game, the step towards saving any bad position is making the correct string of decisions and it's one good decision at a time. And here Magnus made a very important decision that I think probably he's still very much lost, but gave himself by far the best uh, chances of winning. This is the type of position black wins 50% in bullet games that only highlights the uselessness of bullet. Uh, I could not care less about bullet at all. Um, what, uh, what are we gonna do with black here and black? Jason, that's pretty good, I think. It's a good start, at least. Ashish, I'm not sure that's great. Um, don't think it helps a ton.
Arnav, you only get to make one move, and I think one of those ideas is right. All right, so we see a few um, people with various ideas. Um, so some people are giving me king f6, which I don't really understand. Um, I suppose you want to bring the king to e7, but it seems totally far-fetched. So for example, if I go queen b4, king e7, and now rook a6, I don't think you're ever going to make another move for the rest of the game. I think this is absolutely over. Man, it's just like... You're basically stalemated. So people are starting to come around to this reasoning. I think if White is able to play Queen before the game is over, his Rook will get to A6 or something like that, and then uh, we'll be able to um, to make trouble. So got some interesting lines. Uh, the best move is B4, as some people are giving, but I think there's a very different justification behind it that one, than what some want. So following takes, a bunch of people have now given me the move Queen C2, and I think this would be a mistake. Um, so here the problem is, I think after queen, I'm debating it, I think maybe it's best to start with queen c3 and then queen e3. I mean, black will have to ever see it, but maybe we can just go queen e3 directly. Queen g5 is not messing around, and after uh, f6, rook a7 comes, this game is over. It's, it's not even close. Um, so... B4 came, and sure, we stopped White from controlling the beast 4 score, but now we're two pawns down. And the question is, what did we get for it? And here Black has another, I think, quite important move. I believe he's still lost, but with this next move, he can start to fight back a bit. So people are getting this. This should be five. So the first good decision I believe Magnus made was sacrificing a pawn to get his bishop to the b5 square. This did two things. One, it stopped White from using b4 for his queen. Uh, and the real problem that White is facing now is that these two pawns represent his extra pawns. They are not going to queen anytime soon. And uh, I think that what really matters is that we've deprived White of the b4 square and the ability to attack something else. Returning to this position, I think white's extra pawn, the most valuable thing about it is that black can't just like trade a whole bunch of pieces. So if white goes something like queen b4, rook a6, and black responds with like rook b6 and we go queen a5, um, it's going to be, uh, I mean, you're just going to lose the end game. And the problem isn't so much that these two pawns here are going to become a queen, but they're restricting Black's pieces to the point that they can't really do much. And in the event of pieces coming off the board, when you have passive pieces, you'd be thinking, well, I should trade off these passive pieces if my opponents are more active. That is not offering Black any hope of salvation. So this pawn on b5 was very much in the way. And now, at least here, these two pawns are reasonably well under control, and it's hard to see how White can attack another weakness, say on d6. So still, I believe the position is basically lost. Uh, so it went queen e3, f6, queen c3, queen b7, b3, king g6, rook c1, queen b6. And you can sort of see how in a position like this one, it's not that easy to break through. And as Anish is correctly pointing out, this knight has no outpost. Arnav says, why not uh, rook a7 instead of queen c3? Well, rook b7 will come. Maybe this was a better way. In fact, it probably was. Uh, something like take, take, and maybe knight b1. Um, hope for some kind of knight, b, knight c3. But even a position like this one, if we were to play bishop c4, I don't know. I mean, maybe white's just winning. This may have been the best way, but um, but I'm not that convinced. Like, if you play queen c3, there is bishop e2. And your knight will have to come back to the passive d2 square, and queen b5 can come. I don't know. Um, so, but what I really want to focus on is what came shortly after this. So b3, king g6, rook c1, and here, after some moving back and forth, uh, queen c6 came. So, uh, what all is happening now?
So people are realizing this coin is coming around to F5. That's not something we're particularly happy about. What are we going to do? Yeah. So a big part of this is finding only moves. You can talk about strategic understanding all you want, but here there is one move that we find immediately. And we need to find it. Guys, I'm not in the mood for jokes today. I'm sorry. Um, so far, only one person has given me the only move for black. Slow down, calm down, find the only way to keep this game going. That's the first step in saving it. And like an actual reason behind why you want to do it. Yes, Troy, that is correct. People are getting this. The only move is queen d8. Anything else and you just die on the spots. Um, some people are giving me bishop b5, but feels very wrong. Um, If queen v4 or queen d4 or something, queen d7 is made immediately, so that's not going to save it. Um, yeah, queen takes b4 or queen d4, people had given this, but in both cases, I believe queen d7 is immediately the end of the game. Uh, so I don't think you can do that. You need to guard the d7 square in some capacity, and queen d8 is the only way to do it sensibly. A couple people gave me queen b7. Don't think we're particularly thrilled about that pawn dropping, and in the event of queen b4, we still have queen e6. So, um, bishop b5 was offered at some point by someone, but just looks bad. Um, White well, could consider trading the queens and then going knight c4. I don't know. Maybe this is. Anyhow, queen d8 is the move. And this here is another very important juncture. The position is about to change uh, one way or another. Black has um, Black has to choose between letting the... He has a couple options how he wants to play this. He can take on d6, or he can take on b4 and allow white to take on d6. and uh, Or he can trade the bishop for the knight. And this is a huge decision to make. Are we trading the b pawn for the d6 pawn, or are we taking the knight? It's not an easy one either. Uh, or at least I don't think it was easy. Again, during the game, I was watching this live, and I just thought, why are you even still playing this game? You Black just seems so busted to me that it's hard to, um, to imagine him hanging on. But here there is, I think, a very important decision to make, uh, and there's some variations to go along with it as well. Yeah, Nish, that's sort of true. Uh, yeah, you can't do that. All right. Yeah, so a couple of people have given me rook c8, but there's going to be queen c8 and knight e5, so we cannot do that. Um, uh, but most people are getting this right. I think if you take this one, you're basically just lost here. Um, you're not going to make another move. White can duck the queen back somewhere and then go rook c6, and this is bad news. Uh, 
Additionally, I don't know if um, this is also another piece of Magnus and from of Magnus knowledge that I don't know if I've shared with some of you guys is that whenever you have a situation where one side has a somewhat loosened pawn cover around their king and um, but is not facing any particularly major threats just yet, the best thing the other side generally can do is exchange all the minor pieces and leave only the rooks on the board. Uh, some people will probably remember the Ding Lear and Geary game that I like to show. Um, but this is sort of one of those situations. I think that Black's king is somewhat compromised, and here the problem for Black is that if White's heavy pieces and in, in get into the position, like if White gets his rook and queen to the seventh or the eighth rank, he's just made it. It's not even close. And I'm worried for Black that this is going to happen because at some point White's going to start pushing the B pawn, and you're not really going to have a good way to stop both of those threats from um, from being executed. So, for example. I was even thinking, what if we took with the queen on c4 and something like queen b6, we went rook a1, queen b4, and then like queen c7. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Because black's king has been somewhat compromised, as soon as we're left with just heavy pieces, the game is completely over. Uh, because if queen b7, there is going to be um, there's going to be queen d6, and if rook b7, there's queen c8, and then too many threats are coming in, and this is going to be all gone. Queen b6, queen d7, yes, Anish. So um, here, uh, rook takes b4 is a necessity. And after knight takes d6, now we have another decision to make. Um, we are taking that b3 pawn. Uh, we cannot clear, We clearly cannot remain two pawns down, but we have two options on how we want to take this b3 pawn. We can either play rook b6, queen c2, and then something like queen d6, queen e2, rook b3 to exchange off the bishop and the knight, or we can play rook b3 directly and leave the bishop and knight on board. What are we going to do? Why? And let's figure that out. So guys, one thing to always remember is that every single chess principle you can possibly have must be broken when concrete calculation demands it to be so. What are we going to do here and why? This one is more an elimination problem. Honestly, I think probably both moves lose, but one of them gives you a chance and the other one doesn't. If you're giving me a one move variation, you're probably wrong. You need to actually think about how the game is going to proceed more than one move ahead. Okay, so most people are, there's some um, disagreement here. Greg, do you want to make a poll or should we just go forward? I'm on my phone. I can't make a poll from here. Okay, never mind then. All right. Sorry. So, Sarvagna has this right. Sarvagna, do you want to share your answer with us? Okay, so Sarvagna, I can ask you to unmute and just find you. There we go. 
um, I wanted to trade minor pieces, so like rook b6, um, and because like I guess the ideas of knight f5 and like queen e7 or that the rook on the seventh ring is kind of scary. Um, so I think maybe trading minor pieces is better. Uh, I was initially thinking of bishop f3, maybe like uh, keeping the bishop there so there might be like some tricks on the back rank, but it's not that concrete and it seems kind of impos impossible to do that. So yeah, I'd rather just play knight, uh, rook b6. This is strict elimination. If you take this pawn after knight f5, this is checkmate next move and there's not a darn thing you can do about it. You can play bishop f3 for one move, but d6, and queen c7 comes next, and you are mated immediately. And getting mated immediately, you need to avoid, even if it means breaking some strategic rules. I'm sure that, I'm sure here that Magnus was not thrilled about having to take this knight uh, and trade off these minor pieces and get to some miserable position like this. But now, this is, the way that you're going to hold this position is by developing an understanding of how uh, white is going to try to win. The way I see this position, white has three ways to win the game, uh, broadly speaking. Three plans that he can execute to try to win the game. Let's try to figure out what those are, and then we can figure out how to try to stop them. Because here the dust is settled. You are facing no immediate threats. You are just sitting in front of the d6 pawn and hoping that you can prevent white from breaking through. You have no counterplay, but you're not falling apart just yet. You have to come up with your best defensive plan. And in general, when in any position that you're defending, the best pawn, uh, or sorry, the best, the best plan tends to be identify what my opponent's plans are to win the game and then what I'm going to do about it. So Daniel Osaria has actually ha has a very good point. Uh, he's got it just about right. So Daniel, do you want to share with us what the, the winning plans are for white? Rio, stay on topic. Okay, I will, Daniel, I will have to hit ask to unmute on you. I will find you. Just give me a second. Um, okay, I think broadly speaking, the three plans are one, we just push this deep on somehow after like rook c6 or something and we eventually get a queen. Number two, kind of like you were talking about before, we get a rook and queen on the seventh rank or somewhere we can do some nice checkmate or three somehow one day we get f3 or f4 and then get a pawn break yes so here if we can break the block it on this pawn send it through that will win the game if we can play f3 open up the king a little bit make a second pass pawn with g4 that will win the game if we can get our pieces into the back rank and give mate that will win the game if white can pull off any one of these three things he will win the game uh, it looks like right now, though, he's not particularly well prepared to do so. I mean, clearly F3 is not coming anytime soon. Uh, D6 is not coming anytime soon either. And we're not particularly close to shoving our pieces all the way down to the back rank. That said, with Black, we're sitting here. We have no counterplay whatsoever. And we have to just, um, White seemingly has all the time in the world to try to execute any one of these three plans. So with black, what we need to do is figure out what we are going to do about that and why. And there is one very important tidbit that he needs to understand here. So how is black going to try to save this position? Strategically speaking. Anish is getting on the right idea. A lot of people are giving me some version of rook f3 or counterplay. I don't believe it for half a second. White sticks the king on g2. Okay, Jason's getting this, yeah. So whenever we're considering any kind of position, you whether you're better or worse or anything, you always want to be evaluating which trades do I want to make. So here... There's only two sets of pieces left on the board. Queen endgame. Are we going to save this or are we not going to save this? People are saying, I don't, I don't think we're going to save a queen endgame. Like, let's see what a queen endgame would look like. It would be something like, say, rook d1, rook c3. We will get, let's say, some position like this. Here, what's going to go on is this queen is stuck. I'm about to go king g2 and then f3. 
Once you take it, I take here. The king comes up to h3, no checks. G4 comes, second pass pawn is made. This game is over. It's exceptionally easy for white to win a queen end game. And one of the biggest reasons for that is that I think is that the queen is a powerful enough piece that she can give mate, which means that should black try to bring his king around to a square like d7 and leave it there, there's a very real chance that if his queen ever leaves and looks for counterplay, he's going to get mated by white's d pawn and his queen alone. White doesn't need anything more than that. You got something like this, I don't know, check, you might say, okay, time to go get counterplay, yay, like, stick my queen down here, but, like, you're just going to get mated. This queen is, the queen is too powerful a piece. You cannot let your king be alone with a queen and a pawn. That's 10 points worth of material. You will get mated. So, queen endgame I don't think helps you very much. How about a rook endgame? How would we feel about that? People are saying more chances. That's absolutely right. The difference there is that if you get a rook endgame, for example, let's say this game were to continue, I don't know, like queen c2, rook a3, queen c7, take, take. These are obviously stupid moves. Here, black is actually just making a draw on the spot with rook a4. But let's suppose that he goes rook a2 to give white a chance to play rook c4. Black has a much easier time getting his king in front of the pawn and having it be nice and safe. Similarly, white has a much harder time getting f3 through here. I think this is a dead draw. I don't see how you'll ever make progress. This is a markedly different scenario from the queen endgame where black really could not let this d-pawn advance with his king in front of it because his king would end up getting mated. So the first thing to understand here is that we don't particularly mind getting into a rook endgame, while we would very much like to avoid a queen endgame. So the game continued rook d1, rook d4, just some moves were sort of played, and then queen c6 game. So now we have a decision to make. Do we want a rook endgame here? Anish has this correct. Austin, sort of. Yeah, people are also going to understand this. Is this the, if we were to take white's queen, is that the same rook endgame as the one we just looked at? No, it is not. We are going to be looking at an endgame where this pawn has been dragged to c6, which is significantly farther away from Black's uh, from Black's king. For example, something like take and take, and we go king f7, c7. The only way to stop this pawn is with the rook in front of it. What our whole plan was in the previous rook endgame was to get our king to a square like d6, our rook on a2, and sit. Given that that is not happening here after queen c6, and our rook needs to get in front, here we're just going to lose to f3. Like, end of discussion. King e7, f3, take, king f2, game over. Uh, this is clearly gone. So, it's not so much that we mind a rook endgame, but we affirmatively do not want a rook endgame where white has that c pawn that is nice and far away from black's king. So, what move do we have to play here? And Troy's got it right, yeah. Austin, be careful. Okay, between rook d8 and rook a6, which is a better move? Remember, white has more than one way to win the game. Yeah. We have to play rook d8. If you were to play rook a6, this stops white's plan of pushing the pawn through, but it allows white to invade with queen e8, and now a queen is coming and this game is over. So, uh, you must start with rook d8 with the point that uh, you're okay with the rook end game, but here you've kept white's queen from invading the position. So McShane plays rook b1. Not such a subtle move. Here, uh, black is nearly in Zutzwang and has only one move. A big part of saving difficult positions is finding only moves, and that's what we have to do right now. What are we going to do? A couple of people got it wrong already.
So far, nobody's given me the right move, actually. Yes, Frank, well done. Yes, Daniel. Frank, do you want to share with us why that's the right move? No, okay, fine. We'll wait for somebody else to find it. My sister is loud. Oh, man. I'm sure Greg will sympathize. There's only one move to not lose on the spot, so let's find it. Okay, let's put it this way. A lot of people are giving me rook d7. What's wrong with this move? Rook b8 is not the, no, not rook b8, not rook b7. Those are both bad moves. Remember, white has another way to try to win this game. Yeah, Daniel's got this. You cannot play um, rook d8 because of queen f5, and here white's queen invades, rook, b rook b8 comes next, and you are very much done for. So we cannot go rook d7 because this allows white to invade the back rank. So it's queen f8 in the start position. The problem with queen f8 is twofold. One, I can go queen e6, which seems easy enough. Get the queen to f5 and you should get mated. But secondly, I could also go rook b6. And at this point, I'm going to break the blockade and get d6 through. When I think you're absolutely busted as well. So it's actually not an easy position to find a waiting move. But there is one to make. And it, it also depends upon another... Uh, improved understanding of the resulting end games that follow. Avon is suggesting king h6. Yeah, so, all right. So Frank got this. A couple of people got this. Um, the best move is queen d7. Uh, this move sits and waits in a way without allowing white to invade with his queen. But it also comes with a very important piece of understanding. Knowing that this endgame is going to fail because white is ready for rook c1, he gets his rook behind the pawn, and then f3 will come in time. But uh, here it looks like white's ready to invade with something like rook b7 or rook b6. Why is this position different? What does black do now? Everyone's getting this. The point is that we wait for this rook to come to a square like b7 or b6, and now and only now we take the queens because we will get the rook behind the pawn. And here this is just a dead draw. You cannot play f3. There is rook c2 check, and yeah, we're done here. So it transpires that white cannot actually invade with rook b7, but that we need to wait to transition into the rook endgame by first playing queen d7, provoking white's rook off of the first rank, and then once black's rook is able to invade and get behind, he should be in very good shape to save the game. So this is not only finding an only move just because it doesn't hang something, but also because Magnus had a very deep understanding of when the rook endgame would be lost and when it would be savable. Uh, knowing that he's totally happy to let white trade queens at any moment, but he understands that he's only going to do it on white's terms, taking on c6 and allowing white to drag his pawn to c6 further away from Black's king so that uh, Black's king will not be able to come and stop it if he can get his rook specifically behind the pawn. This is the only way he would save the game. So uh, McShane played king g2, waited for a move, waited again, and then came with queen a6. Not a subtle move. What does McShane want next? There's two moves that he would very much like to play. Rook b7, rook b6, either one of these moves really looks like the end of the world. Only one move for black here. What are we going to do? Part of saving this game was understanding. Part of this was incredibly good calculation when it came to only moves. Yes, Frank. Yes, Austin. Austin, you want to share with us? All right, let me find you and call on you. Uh, so if White can get his rooks down there, he's going to lose 
um, Black's going to lose the game. So at this point, Black should probably start searching for a counterplay. So if we play Queen C8 and White just continues with Rook D7 or something, then now we can come in. Uh, we'll come in where? And then uh, Black can come in here with Queen C2 and start harassing the king. I find that very hard to believe. Um, but let me think. Daniel says queen c3. This one I also find very hard to believe. Well, if I, duck, I guess if I duck my queen back to e2, you can go rook a8. Oh, yeah, queen a7. That's like a good move. Yeah. So I think in either case, maybe queen a7 is just lights out. Anisha's saying queen e6, but then I think queen e4, queen d5 might hold on. But queen a7 might just look like the end. I have a strong suspicion we're giving mate here. Is there a possibility you can get away with queen takes e4 check? And then after the king moves, perhaps you can try to take the pawn and escape to f5. Evan says rook d8. Wait, why can't we take on d5? With the queen or what? Yeah, with, with the queen, queen like you just said, yeah. Um, let's say I go rook h7. Maybe if queen g8 here. Maybe I check first and then go mm -hmm. right. This king should die. I'd be very surprised if we can save this. Evan's saying rook g8 first here, but then rook h7 wins, right? Because queen d5 is a rook h5. This looks like bad news. I don't know. Maybe this was feasible. So, wait, wait, rook h5, we can go rook g7, right? Hang on. So this is rook g8 here takes, and then you have rook g7. And this holds by a thread, it looks like. Yeah. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe bringing the queen in was feasible, but there's if we've already decided that, um, that it should be OK to go into a rook end game, there's a much, much, much easier move. I don't know. I, I suspect that it's wrong to play. I suspect okay. it's wrong to play queen c3 or queen c3, but I haven't checked it and I don't really care enough. But um, there is a, a move here that just sort of finishes it. Not even particularly complicated. Mm -hmm. Stay on topic, people. Yeah, Daniel's got it right. This seems pretty convincing. Uh, white cannot take the rook because it is pinned to the queen, and here the queens will come off, and that should leave black with a pretty defensible position. For example, I don't know if we're take, take, get this rook around to a square like b4 next, harass that pawn, and whenever d6 cuts, somebody is making a lot of noise. Can we mute them? That was my bad. My that was Greg. Okay. Um, that explains it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, here uh, we're going to bring the rook to a square like b4 next. White cannot play f3 particularly comfortably, and most importantly, this d pawn means is close enough to black's king that he should hold it. So, I, so Anisha, there's no way for white to press this. I really don't think so. I mean, what could white even try? I mean, rook b4 is already a threat, so, like, I guess, so Anisha is saying we can try rook e3, but like say I bring my king in front of the pawn, f3, and then I can start checking. I don't think you're going to win this one, king f1, more checks. Nah, this should be a draw. I mean, at some point you can go to d3, but like, if we do something like this, even if I just go rook g2 and you cannot move. And I don't know. I mean, it's, it's black will bring his king to d6, and it's king c4 or something, king e7. And I just don't really believe white's going to win this game. Because if you ever play h5, I'm always ready to bring the rook behind. I'm always ready with rook to c2 check. I mean, white's 
I don't know. Probably Black has even misplayed this. My guess is he can play it more accurately. Like maybe I should start with Rook A2 to stop from, from playing F3 directly, but like I really don't think you have much. Um, you can try like I don't know, Rook E2, King F7, King F1, and then F3 here, but like something like this. This is probably a more accurate way for Black. Yeah, this is definitely the better way for Black to play it. And you're not going to break through with white. I don't see a plan. I mean, your king is stuck. The G pawn is always weak. You say take, take rook e2, but say rook c3, rook b3, and then king f2, and I give, I don't know, check and back. I don't think you're going to win this position. Maybe h5, I don't know. Um, but... Uh, I think that White can sort of get that whenever he wants, and probably it makes more sense for him to try to um, at least push a bit with the queens on the board before acquiescing to an exchange. Uh, but here, that became impossible. In order to avoid the exchange of queens, White had to um, sort of retreat to some degree, and now what does Black play? Austin, I don't think that's best. Frank, I don't love that move either. Calculate, guys. A little bit of calculation goes a long way. I mean, if you play a move like queen d6 or queen e7, you're just going to be defending for another 50 moves and hoping white can't find something. I mean, that seems very optimistic. But Ashish Panda has it right. Passive defense is fun. Those are the words of the guy who hasn't played much passive defense against 2700s. A lot of people are giving me queen b5. What if I go queen c2 now? I'm not sure I believe in this. Rook c8 is coming, and we don't want a queen on game. We want a rook on game. I think this is probably going to fall apart pretty fast. Yeah, I think that's where... You've missed a, a real chance here if you play queen b5. There's a much better move. I still think the position is probably lost if, um, if we just make a retreating move. I think white will have time to reorganize the pieces nicely. So a couple of people are giving me queen b2 as well, which I don't really understand. Um, if I get my rook to c6, this feels like bad news for black. Um, I'm very worried about queen e3 coming next. But a couple of people have it, so we don't want to make them wait too long. Um, the best move is queen e1. And uh, the point is here... We're letting uh, d6 or whatever come through, or here we're, we're letting white go rook a6 and queen, rook c6, queen a6. But the problem is, hello. That's checkmate. And it takes a little while for that to happen, but the question is, A, can white stop it? And B, can he do something faster? Um, and... The answer to both is not really no. Uh, white played queen c3 here. And according to the computer, queen b1 just forces a repetition. Uh, after queen b1, you have to go 
uh, Queen C2 or whatever. But Magnus, I saw the game. I was watching the game live on the actual live stream. Magnus took about half a second to grab this queen. He's like, no, no, give me this rook end game right now. And then he got his rook to the outside. And now we will sort of be able to look into a little bit more detail at the kind of positions we were discussing before. I didn't want to go too much into it then because it sort of happens here. So um, this position now, I think, is a relatively routine draw. Black is ready to put the rook on a4 and doesn't seem like there is much to do about it. Um, McShane tried rook d3, but here we sort of see that after king f7, I believe that's an only move as well. I think if we don't play king f7, then d6 can win. Um, here, McShane played f3, which feels cooperative. I would have preferred king f1. Uh, and after, let's say, here white is trying to bring his king up to e3. I think in practice, white has reasonable chances here. Objectively, it's probably still a draw. But yeah, after something like rook a4, rook e3, white can hope to play f3 next and meet g takes f3 with, um, with king f2. It's not like we can just sign the score sheets yet. I think that Black still has some work to do, but I do believe his position is defensible and he should be able to save it with accurate play. And understanding that this was the kind of rook end game and this is the kind of position you have to be aiming for, and then finding all the only moves to get there, this was the game, and it hadn't occurred to me for half a second when I was watching this until Magnus had been going for it, that the rook end game might just be a draw. This was the game that sort of convinced me that Magnus would probably be the next world champion. Um, so McShane tried f3, but now it's a draw immediately, uh, because white cannot bring his king to e3 on pain of rook g2 when it becomes unclear who is playing for a win. So the game continues with here, check, king e1. So now we have a choice to make. Do we take the rook or not? Why or why not? It's connected passwords. Okay, so Ashish is pointing out that once we take the rook, we'll be able to play f5 and get our pawn to e4, uh, which point White's King will be locked out. Does that work or does that not work? Yeah, people are saying that um, we shouldn't take it, and that's correct. Uh, the problem is here, if we were to take and play f5, takes and e4, white will be able to stick his king on a square like f2 and then play g4. At which point, when we get some position like, say, this one, I don't know, d6, you cannot take the pawn, black is sitting and waiting, and we go g4 finally, and then say d7, I guess, we're in time. Uh, and we're going to win. So here the problem is uh, White's king can hold off these three, while this king cannot hold off the other three. But um, but the problem was there is no way for, uh, for Black to avoid that. So Magnus made the correct decision not to exchange rooks, and after d6, rook e4 check, he gets his king back in time. And... Uh, yeah, now it's definitely a draw check, and after e4 check, and then f4, Magnus saves the game. Um, to my eyes, this was an incredible uh, defensive effort for Magnus. Like, the idea that, look, he's not, he's not perfect, nobody is, but to me, it felt as though, while Magnus is not perfect, you sort of have to be perfect to beat him. And... If you can't win a position like this one against him, uh, you're basic. It feels almost impossible to beat him. Like, uh, 
And whenever, and this was him in a bad position, try him in a good position. He'll just crush you. I mean, it, it was, but this was, I mean, I prepared two games for today and we're clearly not going to have time to look over the second one. Uh, but this was the game that has, with Magnus, is I think one of the few, I would say, that has made the strongest impression upon me, which is a little bit weird. I mean, it's not a game people usually think of. Uh, like, oh, this is, you know, one of Magnus's great victories or whatever. It's a game from before he was world champion. He didn't win it. He was groveling the whole game. But it was the one one of his that actually made the strongest impression on me. It wasn't that it was like, oh, such a wildly impressive game. It was more that you could see his strength. It wasn't flashy. It wasn't fantastic. It was just very solid and showing that even when things go horribly wrong, he saves the game. And in addition... I think that having that peace of mind, knowing that he's such an amazing defender, allows Magnus to take a lot more risks than I think a lot of other people at his level do. Or, well, nobody's at his level, but a lot of other you know guys around 2,800 just don't take as many risks as him. I think one of the biggest reasons Magnus takes so many risks is he just, when he gets a bad position, he doesn't expect to lose it, and he rarely does. Uh, and this whole aggressive active players needing to be good defenders is a very important uh attribute um you know look there's there's so much more to magnus than that but this was one of my favorite games of his in any case we've got like eight more minutes so i'm happy greg i don't know if you have an opinion but i think we can just open it up for general q a if anybody has questions yeah yeah totally okay all right, guys, if you have any questions about this or Magnus or this game or anything you want, just put them in the chat, and um, I'll do my best to answer them. Did you study the old classical players much? Like, do you know much about, like, I don't know, like Alapine, Lasker, all those old school players, or are you not, is that not your style? Um, I mean, I read, like, when I was reading my first chess books, those were who they were about. In the modern era, when you can follow games live on the internet, which is not really something that was a thing when I was growing up, I mean, I there's something to be gained from them, large, largely because whenever you saw a classical game where somebody played really well, usually the other guy played really badly. And I think there's often a lot to learn from a game where one side plays really well and the other side doesn't. It really can showcase why moves were so good in a way that you wouldn't necessarily see in a game where you know, one side won, but it was a very tense game all the way through, and the other side only made, like, one or two mistakes. When somebody makes a fundamental strategic understanding error and then another strong, a stronger player exploits it really, really well, which is sort of what a lot of the great quote-unquote classics should be, I think there's something to be seen from that. But in general, I think a lot of it is just nostalgia. It is mind-blowing to me that people think you can learn as much from, like, Alakine as you can from Kasparov or Kramnik or Anand's, like... I think you can certainly learn more from top players nowadays, especially once you're already you've already reached a certain level that you guys are all certainly at. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Is there like a point where it's still maybe more valuable to look to older games? At this, I don't think. I think there may be, but at this point, I think everybody in this class is well beyond that point. Um, other questions? Talk about in chat here. Anybody have any questions? What do you study? We're talking is, about a lot of things. Like, what do you going. study that is different than before to go from IM to GM? I don't really think there's anything different. You study the same things and study them deeper and get better at them. Um, I've always hated this question: What should I do if I'm at X level to reach Y level? Because the problem is, whatever you, whatever you are trying to reach, the best thing you can possibly do is target your weaknesses different people are going to have different weaknesses. If you're an IM looking to become a GM, I can promise you there are some things you are already GM level at, and there are some things you are not yet IM level at. And the aggregate of all of these skills together will make you an IM level player. Uh, if you want to become a grandmaster, 
then you're going to have to bring whatever elements of your game are lagging behind and bring them up to that next level. Each player is going to have very of their game that is lagging behind. And as a result, you're just going to, there's no real one size fits all solution. There's a good question here, Hang on. How to approach lower rated players who want to draw with white? This is actually a very good question. Things that you want to do. Do not fear a boring position, but do not, but try to avoid forced repetitions. So for example, uh, if somebody wants to dry up the game to like a reasonably symmetrical looking position, but there's, you know, I don't know, each side has six pawns and a few pieces, you can play that. You can play the exchange slot for a win with black. In general, I would try to avoid forcing lines. Like if you're playing black, I think good openings to choose would be like Karakhan, uh, classical Sicilian, lines like these where they're generally a bit less forcing in their nature and just the most direct blunt force moves don't like sort of kill the game. If you play e4, e5, and they just go like knight f3, knight c3, d4, you're sort of, it really just forces death pretty quickly. And uh, if you if you play the knight orf and they go bishop g5 and go for the most forcing moves all the way through, it's, you know, it's not even that hard. They press their space bar until it's a draw. Um, Sveshnikov, I don't think, is a... There's also openings that I think are very good for playing for a win against higher-rated players. These would include uh, Sveshnikov. Uh, knight orf is probably very good as well. Um, these are probably not great openings for playing for a win against low-rated players. But keep in mind, I mean, there are some total chickens out there who play chess. Uh, I've definitely met a few, and, you know, I don't particularly respect them. But I really don't think there are that many. Uh, most of the time, when you're playing somebody lower-rated than you, they're not going to shamelessly play for a draw. Most chess players are decent, self-respecting athletes who want to play chess. And they're going to want to try to beat somebody. And uh, I don't think they're going to be a chicken. Uh, there was a time when I was playing the French reasonably often. Uh, I can't remember ever getting E takes D5. I mean, I've long since given up the French, but, you know, I think it's much harder about guys who are playing, trying to play it somewhat, trying to play for a win with white and but taking, playing it somewhat safe. I think these people are much harder to beat than guys who just come to the game saying, I want to go up and move on. All right. I think we have time for like one or two more questions. Is the Petrov good as a main opening? I don't think so. I think it's, in, ter ob in terms of its objective value, I think it's clearly one of the best openings in chess, but I don't think you should be playing it consistently just because it has so much potential for um, for really dry positions. Uh, it's it probably will help your development to some degree to only play lines like that. I really don't think you guys should have a main opening. I think that you guys should be playing a lot of different lines to try to uh, develop experience playing a, a different kinds of middle games and pawn structures. I don't think you guys aren't really at a level where I think openings are that important. I think what is important is that you have chances to grow and to become better players. The way you do that is by getting experience, forcing yourself to make comp difficult decisions in a wide variety of different kinds of positions and growing your knowledge of the game. I don't think you will get that if you play the same opening over and over. Guys who are just like, you know, Grunfeld, Sicilian, 1E4 for white all the way, they don't really learn to play great positional chess. Guys who are like, oh, Queen's Gambit declined, Roy Lopez, Catalan for white, they don't learn to play tactical aggressive chess. If either of these are missing from your repertoire and from your understanding, you generally don't reach your potential. All right. Last question. Is the Karo and Scandi bad? I think the Scandinavians really dubious. The Karo Khan sort of phases in and out of popularity. Recently, it hasn't looked great, but Ferugia has been playing it a little bit with some success. It's probably going to make something of a comeback. Um, I think that you, the best moves for Black on move one are C5 and E5. Anyhow, uh, I think that's, that should do it for today. Um, thanks, guys, for being here. I did my best to show uh, some, th some things I've learned from you know, the best players ever lived, and hopefully uh, you, you picked up on some of it.